Hi, everyone. For, for those of you who don't know the context, uh, John Hunter was the, is the creator of Matplotlib, and he was the plenary speaker, one of our keynote speakers a year ago. And sadly, within a week of leaving the conference, he was diagnosed with advanced stage, uh, stage four colon cancer. And surprisingly, within three weeks, he was dead. Um, and he was a close personal friend. So I wanted to read to a few of us from this community, five of us, attended his memorial service a few weeks later in Chicago. Um, and so I would like to read uh, the eulogy, a slightly edited version of the eulogy um, that, uh, that, was, that was shared um, in that space. Um, and then we will move on to the context. This is not a, a cry fest. Um, the, uh, the best way to honor somebody like John is by continuing to do good work. Dear friends and colleagues, I used to tease John by telling him that he was the man I aspired to be when I grew up. I'm not sure he knew how much I actually meant that. I first met him over email in 2002 when IPython was in its infancy and had rudimentary plotting support via GNU plot. He sent me a patch to support a more MATLAB-style plotting syntax, but I was buried in my effort to finish my PhD and couldn't deal with his contribution for at least a few months. In the first example of what I later came to know as one of his signatures, he kindly replied and then simply routed around the blockage me by single-handedly creating Matplotlib. He was never one to be stopped by what many would consider an insurmountable obstacle. Our first personal encounter was at SciPy 2004, back when it was at Caltech. I was immediately taken by his unique combination of generous spirit, sharp wit, and technical prowess. John was a true scholar, equally at ease in a conversation about monetary policy, digital typography, or the intricacies of C++ extensions in Python. But never once would you feel from him a hint of arrogance or condescension, something depressingly common in academia. John was driven only by the desire to work on interesting questions and to always engage others in a meaningful way, whether solving their problems, lifting their spirits, or simply sharing a glass of wine. Beneath the surface of technical genius, there lied a kind, playful, and fearless spirit who was quietly comfortable in his own skin and let the power of his deeds speak for him. Beyond the professional context, John had a rich world populated by the wonders of his family, his wife Miriam and his daughters, Clara, Ava, and Rahel. His love for his daughters knew no bounds, and yet I never once saw him clip their wings out of apprehension. They would be up on trees, dangling from monkey bars and riding their bikes, and he would always be watchful but encouraging of all their adventures. In doing so, he taught them to live like he did, without fear that anything could be too difficult or challenging to accomplish, and guided by the knowledge that small slips and failures were the natural price to pay for being bold and never settling for the easy path. A year ago, in this same venue, John drew lessons from a decade's worth of his own contributions to our community from the vantage point of Matplotlib. Ten years earlier at UChicago, his research on pediatric epilepsy required either expensive and proprietary tools or immature free ones like IPython's plotting. Along with a few similarly minded folks, many of whom are in this room today, John believed in a future where science and education would be based on openly available software developed in a collaborative fashion. This could be seen as a fool's errand, given that the competition consisted of products from companies with enormous budgets and well-entrenched positions in the marketplace. Yet, a decade later, this vision is gradually becoming a reality. Today, the scientific Python ecosystem powers everything from history-making astronomical discoveries to large financial modeling companies. Since all of this is freely available for anyone to use, it was possible for us to end up a few years ago in India, teaching students from distant rural colleges how to work with the same tools that NASA uses to analyze images from the Hubble Space Telescope. In recognition of the breadth and impact of his contributions, the Python Software Foundation awarded him posthumously the first installment of its highest distinction, the PSF Distinguished Service Award. John's legacy will be far-reaching. His work in scientific computing happened in a context of turmoil in how science and education are conducted, financed, and made available to the public. I'm absolutely convinced that in a few decades, historians of science will describe the period we are in right now as one of deep and significant transformations in the very structure of science. And in that process, the rise of openly available tools plays a central role. John was on the front lines of this effort for a decade, and his accomplishments and with his accomplishments, he shone brighter than most. John's life was cut far, far too short. We will mourn him for time to come, and we will never stop missing him. But he set the bar high, and the best way in which we can honor his incredible legacy is by living up to his standards. Uncompromising integrity, never-ending intellectual curiosity, and most importantly, unbounded generosity towards the, all, all who crossed his path. 
I know I will never grow up to be John Hunter, but I must never stop trying. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Um, now I have the pleasure of introducing Michael Dropoon. Uh, he's a research scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute and is currently the lead developer of Matplotlib. In the memorial spirit of this panel, I'll read a very small snippet of what John Hunter wrote about Michael last year. Since Michael joined the project in 2007, he has been responsible for much of the code that brought Matplotlib for being an excellent tool to a world-class one. No one in the world understands the code from the inside out like he does, and many of his contributions, while often unseen at the surface, have laid the foundation for Matt Potlib to reach further into the wild and wonderful things it can now do. So to the delight of all the conference organizers and a large number of people in this community, Michael took the initiative to uh, spearhead, publicize, curate, and now chair this exciting uh, celebration of excellence in plotting. Thank you, Michael. Wow, <laughs> that's intense. But I, I, I agree with Fernando that let's 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 go on and and, uh, and and celebrate John by celebrating what he was so good at, um, which was really you know encouraging this community to do great things. So, um, let me first introduce how this contest was laid out and and, and constructed. Um, these are these are the rules in a nutshell. Um, Everyone had to use Python-based tools. This is a Python conference, so we wanted to highlight what, what this conference is about. You had to show your source code, had to show your work, um, because this conference is also about sharing that work. Um, uh, the entries would be judged on the clarity of the plot, um, any sort of innovation involved in the style of the plot, and just aesthetics. Obviously, these, these things are very subjective, but we had a panel of about 15 judges, so hopefully that subjectivity kind of works its way out. Um, and also, we wanted it to be based on real scientific work. So coming up with a cool plot, such as a double-jointed pendulum that looks like it's drawn by a cartoonist, um, <laughs> wouldn't really fly in this contest. Um, we, you know, we wanted to we wanted it to be based on on real work that people are doing and 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 showing how the plots, um, you know, enhance people's scientific work. Um, so at this point, I'd like to invite the the winners that are here, and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna introduce each of them in order. I don't think the the contest winners know the order in which they have been ranked yet. So um, if you could come up, Jake and Kristen, uh, uh, Jake Vanderplas, Kristen Thing, and uh, Adrian Price Whalen. Um, there are also two winners who are not here at the conference today. All right, I need a drum roll or something. Okay. <laughs> um, I should also mention we had 24 entries, all of which were of extremely high quality. I was very impressed by by the breadth of, of ways in which people are doing plotting, all in Python, all open source tools. It's really very impressive. And um, certainly something we'd like to do next year as well. I mean, it was such a success this year. Um, so the honorable mentions uh, are Adrian Price Whalen for his plot of dark matter halo potential model, and Nicholas Rougier, who I believe is not here. I hope I'm not wrong about that. Okay. Um, whose entry was about the primary somo somatosensory cortex under the influence of attention and training. Um, so the honorable mentions will be receiving a copy of Beautiful Visualization. It's a great O'Reilly book, um, collection of papers about you know, interesting and novel visualization, which is what this contest is all about. So, Adrian, I'll present that to you. So uh, this is Adrian's entry, and um, I think we have time for each, each contestant to talk for about three or four minutes uh, about their entry. So Adrian? Oh, yeah, you can come up here if you Sure, then you can see it. 
It looks a lot cooler on a computer screen, I guess. The projector kind of dulls it, but maybe that's why I got an honorable mention. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so I won't go into too much detail. Uh, you can't even really read the equation at the top, but basically I'm a grad student in astrophysics at Columbia, and I work on various projects related to inferring the shape and distribution of dark matter around the Milky Way. So I, again, I won't go into too much detail about what dark matter is or why we think it's there, but we do think it's there, and you can assume some functional form for the density distribution of dark matter around the Milky Way. And using some data that I also won't talk about, you can then uh, infer the parameters of that model using, in this case, MCMC. So we talked a little bit about PyMC and other MCMC packages, I guess the last two days, but, or the last day. This is using MC, which is a separate package, and it's, it utilizes ensemble, ensemble samplers, so it uses uh, uh, a number, like uh, a bunch of parallel walkers, essentially. So that's what these, these walkers are on the left. They're showing if you start a bunch of these Markov chains in parallel and then run them, how they, they then converge into the, the posterior distributions. And on the, on the right there are shown the essentially binned samples from the posteriors in the, on, in the traces on the left. So that's that. Okay. <laughs> okay. And the third place winner Oh, sorry, let me, sorry, first, let me show you, let me show you. It was up there for a brief second. Um, this, is, this is Nicolas Rougier's entry, um, and uh, I won't try to do it justice by explaining it, but um, we will be posting all of these online um, after the conference, and along with uh, a blurb and explanation. Okay, so the third place winner is Jake Vanderplas's team, along with uh, Zelko Ivejic. Close enough? Okay. I have, I have a great last name, too. Um, and Andrew Connolly. Uh, it's about orbits and surface col color for 35,000 main belt asteroids between Mars and Jupiter observed by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So I'll put your slide up. And yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, so we're, what we're looking at here are um, correlations between four different variables, and um, plotting four-dimensional plots is difficult. So the the way that we did this is on the, on the left, we're looking at um, basically the colors and the magnitudes, so the reflectivity of the asteroids. So the, the plot on the left, uh, the position on that plot correlates with kind of chemical composition of these asteroids. So you can see that we, based on those, the locations of those asteroids on that plot, we color coded them in kind of a two dimensional color array. And then we replot those same points with the same colors on the right plot. And what the right plot shows are orbital parameters. So we have on the, on the x-axis, semi-major semi, semi -major axis, which is the av average distance from the sun. And on the y-axis is the orbital inclination, so how, how much the, the orbit is tilted with respect to the orbit of the Earth. Um, and the, the really interesting thing here is we see that the, the orbital parameters correlate with chemical properties. And uh, the way we describe that, if we look at these little blue clumps on the bottom right or the green clump on the left, um, what those are are asteroid families, and it shows that these asteroid families came from um, uh, similar progenitors. So the model that we have based on this data is that you had some gigantic asteroids or two gigantic asteroids that collided and then fragmented into pieces that are now in the, with the same orbit and the same chemistry. So I think uh, showing Four-dimensional correlations in this way can be uh, a pretty, uh, pretty intuitive way to, to see those relations. So. Second place winner, Kristen Thing. Thing. A simulation of an idealized tidal channel with a symmetric headland in the middle of an array of 10 turbines near the headland. You're going to have to explain that. <laughs> Okay, so basically in this research we're trying to um, understand uh, the effects of turbines, so uh, kind of like wind turbines but underwater, tidal turbines in this case, on the uh, greater flow channel. Um, so uh, giving a little background information before I can get to this plot, 
um, we did a simulation of an idealized headland channel. So you can see the domain here. We're looking down on it. The flow goes um, left and right, basically, with a tide. And there's a headland, as indicated by the uh, white shape along the top there. So the flow is going back and forth. And we simulated that with, um, uh, without turbines and then with turbines simulated in the code. And um, what I've done, he well, and one of the properties we care about when we do that is um, turbulence. We care about how uh, turbulence can affect mixing that's going on in the system, and it can affect other turbines, for example. There, there are a lot of reasons why we'd care about this. So uh, one of the properties associated with turbulence is the turbulent kinetic energy. So I've taken um, from the one simulation and then the other, the maximum values of this turbulent kinetic energy, and subtracted them. Um, and then what I've shown here is kind of in a diverging way how the turbulence is different in, um, with turbines and without turbines, basically. So um, the turbines are near the headland tip there, um, right in the middle of the channel, and you can kind of see them because they're dark gray. And that means that uh, there's more turbulence where the turbines are located, basically, which is part of the model, so that's what we expect. Um, but then what you can see is down channel from there, uh, it's more red, and that means that uh, the, the opposite thing is happening. So down channel, um, when there uh, are not turbines in the system, there's more turbulence. So because the turbines cause more turbulent dissipation near the headland tip, there's less turbulence downstream, basically. And this is just kind of a way of um, summarizing. There's a lot of information changing in space and time, trying to summarize and get kind of big picture view of what's happening. So I have an inset there to zoom in a little bit and some uh, along and across channel averages to, to also help to quantify this in a more simple way. Thanks. Okay, and the grand prize winner, uh, Edward Taylor, who is, I understand, based in Australia and therefore uh, could not make it. Um, he had a, a entry based on the bimodality among galaxies. And I will just read um, uh, some information that he submitted with his entry, uh, describing it a little bit. Um, so he said, uh, the observational result of bimodality has played a crucial role in the development of our theoretical understanding of the process of galaxy formation and evolution. It seems that there are only two kinds of galaxies, red ones and blue ones. This is, of course, an oversimplification. In simple terms, a blue color implies that a galaxy has formed at least some stars in the past few hundred million years. A red color can mean one of two things. It can either mean a very old stellar population with no star, star formation over the past billion years or so, or it can mean that there is a lot of dust in the galaxy. Dust makes things go red. Think about a sunset on a smoggy evening. So modulo dust, the difference between red and blue is the difference between star forming and dead. The weird thing is that the, the most massive galaxies tend to be red and dead. This is weird because gravity is what drives star formation. Naively, you might think that more mass means more gravity and so more star formation, but that's not what happens. Apparently there is something that kills or quenches the process of star formation in massive galaxies. Nobody knows what this might be, even though this quenching problem is one of the most intensive, intensively studied areas of extragalactic astronomy over the last 10 or 12 years. Models of galaxy evolution have to include some ad hoc prescription for when star formation is quenched, but pretty much every model has its own prescription. No one really understands what the real physical mechanism is. As ridiculous as it sounds, the best way to constrain these models is to simply measure the relative and absolute numbers of red and blue galaxies. Even more ridiculously, even after 10 or 12 years, no one has really measured this well. What people have done in, the, in part is simply to draw a line that divides red galaxies from blue ones. The problem is that if you draw a, line, a different line, you get a different answer. And the decision about precisely where to draw this line is always arguable, hence arbitrary. This is even worse than it sounds. Different choices for the line give you qualitatively different measurements. So what I have done is to develop a mixture modeling approach. Instead of drawing a line to separate red and blue galaxies, I model the data as a mixture of two distinct but overlapping populations. This let me figure out what the number of galaxies in the red and blue populations are without ever specifying whether any particular galaxy belongs to which population. This lets me get around the problem of having to draw a line. In fact, it gives a way to derive an objective phenomenological classification scheme that is based on the data. Okay, 
So, so that's what that is. <laughs> um, Great, and as I said, all of these entries will be uh, posted online with blurbs and links to papers and all kinds of things after the conference um, if, you, if you want any more details. And I encourage uh, uh, more entries next year. I think we will definitely do this next year. It's been a big success. I also want to thank all of our 15 judges uh, who did a great job sort of at the last minute in dealing with some scheduling changes. Um, do, uh, looking at all of the entries very carefully and I think making very good selections. So we have, I believe, about 10 minutes left um, to, to go into some panel discussion. Um, and the first question I thought I'd ask, uh, maybe I'll show both questions actually at once since we are limited in time. First question was, uh, how do the plotting tools in the Python ecosystem, so that includes Matplotlib, Chaco, Boca, other things that are coming along, um, compare with other ecosystems, such as in MATLAB or IDL or Microsoft Excel, let's throw that out there. Um, the other question uh, I, I have, and maybe we can kind of just address these in parallel as we discuss, is where does Python plotting currently fall short? Um, not just versus these other tools, but just even blue sky thinking, you know, wh where, where should we go and where, where do we need to go? Um, so without further ado, maybe I'll start with Jake and pass the microphone to him. Um, I won't comment on other tools because I haven't really used them, but um, uh, as, as far as where plotting needs to go, I was very excited to see this, uh, the web backend for matplotlib because in my view, that's, that's the thing that we're missing right now is the ability to publish plots in a format that is both interactive and um, easily available to any reader. And so I think um, browser-based browser interactive plots are the, the thing that we need right now. So um, looking forward to more work on, on that coming up. Yeah. Well, that works well because I think I'm better suited to handle the first question. Um, I used MATLAB for a long time, and now I'm using matplotlib almost exclusively. And I found I can do a lot of the same things, but it's easier in matplotlib, and it looks better, basically. <laughs> so I already have approaches that I was using before, and I'm using similar approaches, but just finding it um, less kludgy in general. I'm able to, there are uh, examples in the example gallery to do what I want to do. Um, I can follow, and um, they work pretty well, you know, fiddle a little bit, but mostly I can just kind of do them, and it, it works, and it looks good. And um, you can kind of tell the difference in my plots, too, so, <laughs> like pre-Python pre and post-Python, so I, I think it's, it's good. <laughs> Maybe I'll just say nonsensical things about both of them then, since they commented on one each. Uh, so the first, I guess, the ecosystem, the only other plotting ecosystem I've used is R. Um, I think even in the last few years this has changed, but it used to be the fact that in R it was easier to just go from data to plot and get a nice looking plot like that. But I think now that's just a matter of having a good matplotlib RC file in Python and then you're, you're in the same uh, with things like pandas and, and astropy, which are things that I use a lot. Um, now it, it's their equivalent, I think. Or maybe even better in Python. Uh, in terms of the second question, where does it fall short? Um, I guess I can speak from one thing that I deal with a lot, which is multi-dimensional, visualizing multi-dimensional data sets. Something we do a lot in, in astronomy, and I know most fields have to deal with this as well. But the concept, again, of being able to publish a plot that, that's interactive, but also has states, so that you can say, here's this interactive tool, but figure one, I can click this button and it puts this multidimensional view into a state that represents whatever you're trying to, to show in your figure one. So you can essentially have all of your figures in one interactive view of your data, but then there are multiple states that, that bring up different um, viewpoints on that plot. I don't know, that's just something that I've, I've been thinking about a lot over the, the past couple months. And wanting to see, so. I think that's a really good suggestion, and it dovetails really well with the idea of IPython as a publishing tool, right? Um, and you not only want to provide an interactive plot, but also a, a sort of guide to it, so the user isn't just 
redoing your data exploration for you, but you can point out, you know, here's, here's the interesting bits. That's, that's, that's really cool. Um, we can open to questions for the panel. Uh, we have five minutes. Um, yeah. In front, and then I'll take you next. The question is, um, do, do we have any familiarity with Tableau or any other commercial tools that have extensive plotting capabilities? I don't think I can personally address that, no. Um, something maybe, you know, maybe, maybe at some point we should put a boff together of you know, people who are coming from these other tools and, 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 and talk about what we can bring from them. So there was a question further back. Oh, sure. The question is, um, since the, one of the rules of the contest was you have to use all Python tools, maybe uh, each of the, the contestants could enumerate the tools that they used. So if you want to see my plot, you can go to astroml.org and uh, <laughs> click on book figures chapter one. It's in there. This plot's going to appear in our textbook uh, next, next winter when it comes out. Um, I used uh, NumPy. Um, this is basically just NumPy and Matplotlib and then a data set loader from AstroML. Yeah, I used NumPy and Matplotlib, but a little more specifically, I used um, Contour F. I use pcolor and Contour F a lot for my plots um, for showing X, Y, and then some color to represent some other field. I do that a lot. Uh, I used inset axes to zoom in, and I, I found that to be a really cool thing. I, I'm using that more and more to zoom in on kind of at highlight something or to, well, probably mostly to highlight something. Um, and then I've been using a lot of uh, adding axes on. So I, I added axes below and to the side of my um, main plot, and that's been a really nice way to, uh, I think, a really nice way to bring in another piece of information that's related to whatever is going on. Um, and I've experimented both with doing that, you know, outside the plot or inside the plot and using, a, using space in a, in a way like that, and playing around with color maps a lot, too. Yeah, I guess for making the plot, it was just matplotlib, but uh, then I guess the data came from, from MC, which the um, likelihood function I use then calls a whole number of other things which involve MPI and running on a, a cluster doing integration. So NumPy, SciPy, MC, Matplotlib, those are the, the big ones. Yes. The, the question is um, if we could talk about style. And I, I assume by that you mean colors, line styles, that sort of thing, styling of the plot? Yeah, layout. Um, and, and your experiences with that. I mean, I, I, I think that's a, 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 it's a good candidate for growth. It's certainly in Matplotlib. I, I'm not as familiar with the other tools, but uh, yeah. Well, I. When I use Matplotlib for publishing papers, I end up tweaking a lot by hand, and I think that's probably pretty common. So I, I have these incredibly long, you know, s just statement after statement of adjusting subplots and ticks and axes, and that's uh, that might be one of the well, a good answer for the earlier question and something that Matplotlib could grow in. Um, it's very powerful if you want to spend an hour making sure every line is in the right place, um, but that doesn't happen automatically. So. Yeah, it's a lot of, lot of investment. Yeah, so uh, also going off of what I said before about going from MATLAB to um, matplotlib, I, I really like how there are just tons of color maps available. There are tons of line colors available. It's so convenient. Um, so I spend a lot of time thinking about what colors are most intuitive for um, whatever data I'm presenting. Um, I and also utilizing the space that I have for bringing in other information, like I mentioned before, too. And sometimes I, it can be three or four other pieces of information that I can utilize in my space. And I do tweak a lot, like, um, like Jake said, in terms of moving the axes around so they're just perfect and moving the labels around so they're just perfect. So there's, there's, there is a lot of tweaking, but it, um, 
the functions to get the stuff on there in the first place are kind of right there and convenient for getting it started. Uh, I guess in terms of color, yeah, I spend most of my time in, on Color Brewer. I don't know if any of you know Color Brewer 2. Uh, that's a great website if you don't know it. It's color, colorbrewer2.org. And all of the color schemes that they have are implemented in Matplotlib, but if you just want to have like three lines that are different colors, it's a great place to say, okay, I need them to be sequentially related or diverging colors or whatever. So it's, I, I would definitely recommend that. Um, in terms of general style, I find that Matplotlib often will get you close just with defaults or with the, the built-in commands, but as both of them alluded to, then it's often a little frustrating to get exactly what you want because you need to nudge things over slightly and you don't know what units the number you're passing in are. Are they in terms of fractional space between some subplot and the next subplot or is it in terms of the whole figure size or what? So I think that's definitely something that we can work on in Matplotlib. Real quick, another, another style thing, very quickly with, with color. Look up uh, the cube helix color map. Everybody should be using that. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> for a number of reasons. <laughs> okay, great. I think we're out of time, um, if I'm right. Yeah, and uh, so thank you again to all the contestants, and it's been really f fun organizing this this year. Thank you.